this week we picked this topic knowing that you know we've got silage harvest well underway in most of the state and we're even picking some high moisture corn maybe in the southern parts of the state currently and corn crop residues are something that we don't talk about near as much here as maybe we should you know Missouri is a top 10 state in terms of corn production according to the Missouri Department of Agriculture website and Certainly, it is a resource that other states have really figured out how to take advantage of and, and use to enhance their beef cattle operations. And just so y'all are aware, this is going to kind of look like a University of Nebraska fest today, at least in the content I provide, but that's by design. They have really sort of grabbed the bull by the horns and done a lot of the work that's demonstrated the potential for the utilization of corn crop residues by beef cattle and, and how there's synergies that potentially exist within the two. But I think what we need to do today to, to sort of start this conversation out is to understand what it is and what it's not. And I, I like to do that by going to the cow first and giving you all a, a frame of reference in terms of their nutrient requirements. So this graph is a graph of a 1300 pound cow's uh, maintenance energy requirements. Think of them as her nutrient requirements over the course of a production calendar. Okay, and so on the bottom, we've got months since calving. The graph essentially starts the day she calves and, and ends 365 days later. One of the great things that I don't think we appreciate enough about beef cattle is the fluctuation in nutrient requirements that a beef cow will go through over the course of a calendar year of a production cycle. Her nutrient requirements are going to peak about 60 days post calving when she's at reaches peak lactation. And once we wean a calf off of her, you know, somewhere around the seventh month after calving, her nutrient requirements are going to drop by 40%. And so you'll notice that there's a significant fluctuation over the course of that entire year. Now, what I want to point out to you all is that crop residues are not intended to or do not work best when we try to fall calf. We have to be real with what we're harvesting or what we're using the cow to harvest for us off of these crop fields. What this is, is this is a resource that can fill that gap that are filled the nutrient requirements during those, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth, into maybe the eleventh month since calving, but certainly something that we wouldn't want to intend to calve on. And so think about this as you watch this presentation today. Think about this more in the context of I've just weaned some calves off my spring calving cows. You know, I need somewhere to go with them. I need some cheap feed to feed them to to sort of get them through. This is a great option. Now, when we think about crop residues, we have to think about the quality and put that into context. When you turn cattle out on corn stalks, you're turning them out onto four different resources. One would be any drop ears, any grain that was potentially not harvested off of the field. Now, you know, once upon a time, that might have been a substantial quantity relative to the equipment that we had available to us. You know, modern combines and modern harvesting equipment you know, we may not see that eardrop like we would have previously, but certainly, you know, when you think about grain, at least according to this University of Nebraska Extension publication, you know, if grain is 4% of the dry matter or the feed that is left in a crop field after harvest, you know, relatively small proportion, but it's a really high quality feed. The other three components, so leaf and husk, stock and cob, we wouldn't normally be harvesting. Now, the leaf and husk make up approximately 45% of the material that's left behind. Stock makes up 40% and cob makes up 11%. Now I wanna point out to y'all that you'll notice in terms of forage quality, we can talk about it in two proportions. We can talk about it either as crude protein or as, and you'll see here it says IVDMD percent. That stands for in vitro dry matter disappearance. Think of it as TDN. Um, you know, we talk about total digestible nutrients as a proxy for energy in beef cattle, in particular for beef cows. Um, think of that IVDMD as a TDN number. Now, before we sort of dive into the minutia of those, um, any of y'all that have heard me speak at length before have heard me try to sort of simplify nutrient requirements for beef cows into three rules of thumb for both protein and TDN. And the crude protein rules of thumb that I use are 7, 9, and 11. 7% crude protein diet for a cow that's in mid-gestation but not lactating. 9% for the cow that's in her last trimester of gestation. 11% for a lactating cow. And then from a TDN perspective, we're looking at 55% TDN for that same mid-gestation non-lactating cow. 
60% TDN for the late gestation cow and 65% TDN for the lactating cow. And you'll see here that the IVDMD of these various components is not terribly impressive relative to the beef nutrition rules of thumb, but when you allow these cows to mix a diet that takes some grain, that takes some leaf and husk, and maybe minimizes the amount of stock that they're consuming, stock and cob, you can actually get these cows to self-select a diet that will meet their nutrient requirements during that low point in their nutrient requirements each year. And in fact, you may even select a diet that would allow them to gain a little bit of weight. Now, this picture here is a picture out of the University of Nebraska as well, and it's the grazing characteristics of cows on corn stalks. And so on the left, you've got essentially what they did is they went out and they turned cows out to graze and they harvested the feed that they had grazed out of their stomach. Now, I imagine they used a, a ruminally cannulated cow to do that. The picture on the right is a picture of a cow pie in regard to cattle that had freshly been turned out onto corn stalks. Cattle will be selective grazers on these stock fields under normal management conditions. They're going to select the corn first, which would be indicative of a high diet quality. They'll select the husk and leaves second, which would be medium quality. And then if you leave them out there long enough, they'll be forced to consume cob and stock. And so that's the point where we're going to be well below the nutrient requirements of even those cows that are mid-gestation and non-lactating. So let's talk about the stocking rate now, because we, we kind of have to make heads or tails out of it. It's not something that is as simple as an acre inch is worth 400 pounds of dry matter, the way we think about with cool season grasses like tall fescue. There's a really simple rule of thumb that will kind of get you in the ballpark that many folks will talk about, and that's dividing the bushel yield per acre by 3.5 to give you the number of grazing days per acre for a 1,200 pound cow. The amount of residue that's going to be left behind is directly proportionate to the yield of the forage. And so the greater the yield of grain, the greater the yield of residue afterwards and vice versa. The amount of residue that's left behind, as you'll see in the next bullet point, is about 16 pounds of leaf and husk per bushel of grain. And so if you put that into a, a scenario. So Missouri's average corn yield, according to the Missouri Department of Agriculture website, was 150, 145 or 150 bushel per acre. So I just used 150 bushel for easy math. If you multiply 150 bushel per acre times that 16 pound leaf and husk per bushel of grain, you get about 2,400 pounds of dry feed per acre. Now here, we're obviously not going to get all 2,400 pounds of dry feed per acre in those cows' mouth, and so we have to assume a harvest efficiency, or another term that you all might be more familiar with is a forage utilization rate. We'll assume that about half of that feed will end up actually in a cow's mouth at the end of it, okay? And so that leaves us with about 1,200 pounds of dry feed per acre. A really good rule of thumb in that 150 bushel per acre scenario, and maybe even a little less than that, is about an acre a cow a month. People who have asked me this question before, you know, I've typically told folks to plan on 60 days of grazing and to do two acres per cow under a 60-day management scenario. And I'll get into why here in the next slide. The next question that naturally comes up is, if I'm going to turn these cows out on what looks to be relatively low quality forage, am I going to need to supplement them? Now, again, what we've got in this graph on the right side, so we've got that same in vitro dry matter disappearance value, that's the y-axis, and then we've got the days of grazing on the x-axis. You'll notice that those days of grazing go from zero to 60. So, over the first 30 days of grazing, these cows select a diet that's somewhere between 55 and 70 TDN, as you can see, which would meet that bottom threshold in our beef nutrition rules of thumb. However, once we get past the 30 days over those last two months, we get to where energy begins to be limiting. And the reason that that happens is we change the proportion of material that the cow ends up grazing. Under that same scenario, protein is going to become limiting and perhaps to an even greater extent than energy after about 30 days on the same field. And so if you're thinking about trying to get 60 days on the exact same land area 
you know, you're probably going to need to provide some protein supplement after 30 days. And, you know, a good rule of thumb is, you know, when a cow's limiting in protein is to try and put a half a pound of crude protein, not a half a pound of supplement, but a half a pound of crude protein per cow per day into her to help meet those protein requirements. And most importantly, to meet the requirements for protein that the bugs in the rumen have. So another question that will often come up is the effect of grazing on subsequent grain yield. So this again comes from the University of Nebraska. This is the effect of, you know, essentially corn stock grazing on corn grain yield over a five-year period from a field that is just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. So the ungrazed corn yield off of a field that was never subjected to corn stock grazing was 148 bushel to the acre. Under light and heavy fall grazing, you'll notice that at least in terms of statistics, there was no difference. That's what that SEM and p-value over on the right stand for. Now, numerically, it looks like they're within four and, and seven bushel to the acre, but you know, from a statistical perspective, there's no difference. And then the same thing, you'll see the, the baled corn stock yield or subsequent yield if the corn stocks are baled is right in that same boat as well. And so while this is only a five-year study, we probably could look at it from a longer time frame and ask those same questions. If you think about it, the cattle are actually serving to help you recycle nutrients on that field if you're grazing rather than if you're baling those corn stalks and feeding them elsewhere or, you know, as some might do, actually just using them for bedding. And so the cows, in a sense, can help you recycle some of the carbon, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, you know, all of those, those elements that are important to successful farming. So now the last piece of this puzzle, and the piece of the puzzle, honestly, that I probably should have started with is what is it worth? How much can I pay for corn stocks? Or conversely, how much should I charge for corn stocks if I was a landowner who was hoping to harvest these? Now, there's a bunch of different ways of going at this calculation. The way that I've chosen to present to you here today is a one where we talk about it from both the corn farmer and the cattleman's side. Now, from a corn farmer's perspective, you know, the University of Nebraska estimates that it costs about $6.25 an acre to shred the stocks, to basically to knock those stocks down, and that's in fuel, labor, and repair. So if you work off of that $6.25 an acre framework, if you divide that by 30 days or for one month of grazing, that's essentially 21 cents per cow per day, assuming that we're at one acre per cow per month. Now, there's a couple of things that aren't factored in there that are a bit more subjective. And if anybody wants to jump in in ask or in discussion after we finish up here, it's certainly worth discussing. Is compaction from grazing going to be an issue? And is that going to affect the effort that I have to put in tillage the next year if I'm utilizing a tillage cropping system? From the cattleman's perspective, that 21 cents per day sounds awful impressive. But, you know, what about fence, water? transport care. So, you know, we're probably not going to be at 21 cents a day when we're really diligent about factoring all of those things in. Now, an alternative use is bailing those corn stalks for bedding or for feed. And the estimated cost, at least according to a recent Beef Magazine article, was that it costs about $40 an acre and that you get between a bale and a half to two bales per acre in corn stalks. So there's several different ways to look at them. And I want to point out to you as, as I finish up here, the University of Nebraska has actually created what they call a corn stock grazing calculator. And it is an Excel file that I've got the picture at the bottom below that will allow you to put some inputs in, in terms of number of head, acres rented, cost per acre, distance to haul the cattle. If you have to haul them long distance, it factors all of these in to give you uh, you know, from a cattle perspective side, what your cost per cow per day is in terms of utilizing corn stalks as a feed resource. Now, if you're at 21 cents a cow a day in the actual rent, and let's say you have to put another 50 cents a cow a day in all of those other factors, hauling them out there, caring for them, providing supplement and water, the question you have to ask yourself is, and I, I picked that 50 cents relatively arbitrarily, if I can feed a cow for 60 to 90 days for less than 75 cents a day, 
you know, I'd have to think that that's a pretty dang good deal. Because if we look at annual cow costs these days, one of the big banes of the commodity cow-calf production system, and by commodity cow-calf production system, I mean the producers who are selling calves at weaning at the sale barn. One of the things that we've seen is that feeder calf value has not escalated at the same extent that input costs have. And in fact, you know, there'll be some estimates these days of annual cow cost being over $800 a cow a year with feed being representing approximately 60% of those costs. And so if you're at $500 a cow a year just in feed for over 365 days, I'm not savvy enough to do that exact division in my head, but I'd have to think that you're at at least $1.25 a cow a day over the entire production year. And so that 50 cents a cow day difference between the $1.25 and the 75 might represent a significant cost savings for an operation and should be motivation perhaps to investigate doing this further. There is a really nice extension publication that Grazing Crop Residues with Beef Cattle that the University of Nebraska has put out as well. That's the top link in this page here as well. And then that third link is another popular press article that's been put out by the University of Nebraska that I think really does a nice job of summarizing the kind of leverage points and trying to figure out if corn stock grazing is for you as a cattleman. 